What's the connection between tomatoes, genetics, fire, and 50,000 years of Aboriginal knowledge? We're going all the way to Australia to connect the dots. <laughs> It's one of the coldest days of the year in the mid-Atlantic U.S., but a short time ago, I was in one of the warmest places on Earth. Usually I'm telling you about other people's research, but on this one, I'm actually part of the team. And this project has shifted my entire perspective on the connection between Western science and traditional ecological knowledge. The work we're telling you about today is rooted in Western Australia, specifically the vast area extending from the southern edge of the Kimberley region through the Western Desert Cultural Region, an ancient, semi-arid landscape inhabited largely by Aboriginal Australians who share a deep connection to this place and a knowledge of the organisms that live here that has been passed down generation to generation for millennia. One set of these organisms that holds particular importance is a group of plants in the genus Selenum, known to many Australians by the English common name bush tomatoes. I've been working on the bush tomatoes of Australia for about 20 years, ever since I was a PhD student in the early 2000s. And uh, over those couple of decades, we've done all sorts of stuff, plant reproductive biology and ecology and evolution. But the one sort of missing piece, the thing that I've like talked about and read about, but never really got to do is sort of the ethnobotanical side of things. The uses of these plants by Aboriginal people. And in particular, I've never really been able to learn directly from those folks what they know, right? Which is based on tens of thousands of years of knowledge rather than my two decades worth of knowledge. Strangely enough, my opportunity would come from a source that was only about an hour's drive from my research lab. While searching online for recent work on a bush tomato called Solanum diversiflorum, Dr. Rebecca Bleegy Bird, anthropology professor at Penn State University, came across my recent scholarly communication about growing the species in our research greenhouse. Okay, it was a tweet, but that tweet turned out to be the beginning of a fruitful collaboration in which my lab's work on bush tomatoes and population genomics would complement the work of a person whose expertise and connections are pretty much unparalleled. I work in an Aboriginal community of Mardu people in a remote part of Western Australia, and we have been living and working in the community for the past 20 years, um, learning about and documenting traditional hunting, gathering, and landscape use. Our focus for most of this time has been on the way that the use of fire creates uh, plant diversity at the landscape scale, and then how this diversity affects the productivity and sustainability of Mardu hunting. When Rebecca reached out to me about the work we were doing because she figured out that we were, you know, essentially the only other research group that was working on this species that we later knew was called Wamala, um, I was sort of, you know, shocked to know someone else was really thinking about this particular bush tomato. And when it turned out we were only 50 miles away from each other, it was like too good to be true. Penn State and Bucknell are 50 miles apart in Pennsylvania, USA, but in Australia, our research area, basically the entire natural distribution of Wamala, spans thousands of kilometers. So we headed to Western Australia with a plan to split up into two teams that would allow us to cover as much ground and visit as many Wamala populations as we could in about a month's worth of fieldwork. My team started north on the Great Northern Highway and trekked east along the southern edge of the Kimberley region, then came back west and went south along the coast into the Pilbara region, while Rebecca's team headed to Mardu territory, where they worked closely with the community there. For the first few days, we were sort of out in the field thinking we were going to start running into this species that we were trying to sample, Wamala. But after a couple days, we were like, you know, where is this species? We were looking at historical records and trying to find this thing. And then finally, boom, there it was, right? At a site that was well known, but it was the first time we saw this species blooming and in fruit. And the whole team was psyched about it and we just got into it. And then really for the next like 15 days, every day, all day, we were sampling for this plant. Normally when I tell people that I study wild eggplant relatives, things that are called tomatoes, uh, people say, well, can you eat it? Can you, can you use it for anything? And, and usually I say, no, actually these things are not typically edible, but this is, a, this is one species, among it turns out a few, that actually has been used for thousands of years by people in Australia. Um, so the opportunity to now study this thing and tell that part of the story is really exciting to me. And I think that's one of the things that makes this 
project really special. Using population genomics methods, we're really trying to figure out um, how Aboriginal peoples and within our group we're working with um, Mardu, how Mardu um, are influencing the genetic diversity and the genetic health of Wamala and comparing that to populations that are outside of the Mardu community. But equally special was the rest of the team that we assembled, including Dr. Tanisha Williams. Tanisha took the lead on our genetics work and has played an integral role in sharing the news about our science, but after a couple of years on the project, she still hadn't seen a wamala plant in the wild. Until you're in the country, until your feet are on the soil, all of those uh, differences or even similarities don't really connect until you're there. And especially these plants that I have been working on for so long had just been these dried specimens. And to see them alive and healthy and these really abundant populations and to see these beautiful fruits on them, it was a really magical trip and it was a wonderful experience. Of course, our few weeks in the field would pale in comparison to the historic presence of Mardu people in the region, and we had a suspicion that the things we'd see in our eventual genetics results might be strongly correlated with the way in which Mardu manage the lands they live on and how they interact with wamala fruits and seeds during the harvest season. In the process of cleaning the fruit, Mardu dispersed the seed within the patch, and in carrying whole fruit to new locations, Mardu act as long-distance seed dispersers. So Marty believes that if people forage in the ways that they have always done, if they burn properly, if they hunt properly, if they clean fruit properly, the landscape will be rich and productive for many years into the future. Wamala, like many other selenums, is a disturbance-adapted species. Without some sort of perturbation, wamala plants will be outcompeted and replaced by grasses and other species that become ecologically dominant. Traditional burning by the martyr resets the ecosystem and releases nutrients back into the soil, leading to fresh new growth of many species and a flush of new seed germination for wamala. But not unless there is already plenty of wamala in what botanists call the seed bank. That is, all the seeds stored up in a habitat waiting for an opportunity to grow. Mardu tradition dictates that this is indeed always the case for wamala. Mothers will tell their children, don't carry the fruit too far from the patch. Always clean the fruit near the patch so that the next time the patch will still be there. And the biggest patches can be several hectares in size. In such patches, you could pick more than seven kilograms of fruit per hour. Um, you could camp there for days, as Marty say, you can camp there for days and support a big mob of people. How does Rebecca know all of this? Well, she has spent two decades immersing herself in and connecting to Mardu culture sometimes with other anthropologists, but always with collaborators from the Mardu community, like Cheyenne and Shailene Taylor. Over the years, Rebecca has gone from visitor to community member, eventually getting the news that she's really become more like family. And she said, we decided to adopt you as our daughter. Even though our age difference wasn't big enough, I was still a child, I was still a Mardu child, right? Asking all these questions. So my elders then, told me that my role in the community is to learn the right way because there's so much misinformation out there about what Aboriginal people are doing, especially with fire, and then to teach others what's actually going on so that hopefully we can minimize some of the racism that goes on um, with respect to Aboriginal people. Rebecca's bond with the Mardu made our research possible, creating an opportunity for a project that now somehow connects the western desert to the lab benches and greenhouses of Pennsylvania, and much like we've seen with Cheyenne and Shailene, is germinating into projects for other up-and-coming scientists, like Penn State PhD student Amy Robleski. As we encountered these plants in the field, I had some calipers and I was measuring things like the size of the fruit, so the height and the width, the number of prickles, because these plants are super prickly, and maybe maybe if they're a little less prickly, they're easier to pick. 22 for the prickles. But also I was measuring the sweetness of the fruit with a spectrometer. So I would squeeze some juice out onto basically this lens, and it would be able to use how the light bends within this machine to tell me how sweet the fruit is. We're gonna measure the sucrose concentration, so the sweetness. So, read. Let's see how it does. 8.4. Wow. So that is on the sweeter side of all the fruits we've measured. So I'm measuring things like sweetness and that sort of thing to see if have people picking these fruits led to sweeter and sweeter fruits over time or 
more vibrant colors so it's easier to notice if they're ripe. So just traits that people might actually be driving the evolution of. What I saw from these results so far is the species has a huge range, but in that range, it basically ranges from a cranberry to an apple or a pear. So it's all edible, but how tasty is it? But for folks in the desert where there's not lots of other sweet foods, that's still pretty sweet. So Mardu preferences have possibly led to wild plants with larger, tastier, maybe even less prickly fruits. But how about the genetics? The managing of plants and animals in the Australian desert, genetic diversity and the genetic health of these species is actually associated with the practices of hunting and foraging and things like that. And so within Wamala, we're seeing that signature genetically. Plant populations within the Mardu community have greater genetic diversity. They are healthier. They're more connected to each other. There's a lot of gene flow in these populations when we compare that to populations outside of the Mardu community and populations that are not managed um, by Mardu. In other words, one could say that this plant species, Wamala, aka Selenum diversiflorum, actually does better when the habitats it lives in are under the care and stewardship of local indigenous peoples. Connecting this ethno-botanical work and traditional ecological knowledge was one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of this project. To learn more about the botanical side of things, but then also learn more about the people who use this plant. And also to be a part of a research group that we are actively talking to this community. Um, some of the folks within our groups are members of this community, and they are telling us what they want to know about a staple food source within their community. So this is a true partnership that we're working with the Mardu community. So it's meant a lot to be a part of this type of collaboration and this type of partnership. My name is Derek Watt. I was living with my grandmother, grandfather, in Bunwood, Cotton Creek. As a young age, and they always took me out hunting, gathering bush food. Just living that life in the bush. Most of people was picking, hunting, gathering for many years and passing their knowledge to young people like us. And what to eat and what not to eat. I've learned along the way through my grandmother, my grandfather. It's passing on their knowledge to the next generation. And Wamla was the main source of food when he was in a drought time sometimes. He can hardly get some tucker, but it was stable for them to pick as murder people. You know, it, it, it's special for us as murder people, you know. Someone coming out for, out for here and teaching us also <clears throat> and passing knowledge to one another as murder people. As both Derek and Tanisha point out, one of the highlights of this partnership has been working in Australia, interacting with each other and, of course, with the plants. Fieldwork isn't always easy and it isn't always comfortable, but it is a tradition that field scientists hold dear. And like the Mardu, we love to pass that knowledge on to the next generation. People like Bucknell undergraduate Claire Marino. As I've been applying to graduate schools and hopefully you know, pursuing a graduate degree uh, next year, this experience definitely shaped um, you know, what I really want to get out of that. I definitely know that I want fieldwork to be part um, of achieving that degree. It was a really formative experience um, and I know um, I want to seek out more like it. Good things can happen when people interact directly with nature and this is something that has become more and more clear as our Wamala project continues. But the thing is this really isn't a coincidence or some set of random effects. And Marty know exactly what's going on. Well, we often tend to think that indigenous knowledge is like a metaphor or a belief system. It's clear here that it is just good ecology. Marty belong to this landscape. They shape it in ways that support life. And without this everyday act of living on the land, species disappear. The disappearance of species is a sad fact of our current biodiversity crisis. And although modern science has the potential to produce solutions that might stave off the loss of millions more species and save our own in the process, we also can't afford to ignore the bodies of knowledge that have developed among indigenous cultures over thousands of years. 
It's heartbreaking to consider how much of that knowledge has already disappeared. But what is left ought to be considered one of humanity's greatest treasures. The conservation of biodiversity requires that we safeguard indigenous culture, indigenous languages, and indigenous peoples. We need to protect and respect traditional ecological knowledge at all costs. If we're concerned about the loss of biodiversity globally, we should take indigenous knowledge systems seriously, not as metaphor, but as serious science. This episode of Plants Are Cool 2 was made possible in part by a grant from the National Science Foundation.